Welcome, 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 everybody. It is time for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Wednesday. You made it. We're here. It's time for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. We gather here around the glow of the museum's YouTube channel in order to meet interesting people who are doing interesting things out there in the world of science, nature, conservation, education, and more. And it is always great to be with you. We have a great time here on this program, learning new things, meeting cool people. We're going to do that today as well. My name is Chris Smith, coordinator for current science programs here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. As always, or as most of the time, I will be your host for today. As we go throughout the program today, I want to remind all of our viewers that uh, this is a conversation. We're going to do a presentation part, and then we're going to do an audience Q&A part. And when we do the audience Q&A part, I need the audience, that's all of you watching, to do the Q part so that our guest experts can do the answering part. So as we go through the program, make sure that you're typing up your thoughts, your experiences, your questions for today's guest speaker into the chat so that we can have an awesome conversation a little bit later in the program. Uh, for today's presentation, uh, well, of course, I should say the Lunchtime Discovery Series is also brought to you by the Office of Environmental Education, which is a part of the Department of Environmental Quality. And so for today's program, they have reached out to some other folks within the Department of Environmental Quality in order to get some interesting expertise and learn a little bit more about what's going on within DEQ, which I have to say, the Department of Environmental Quality is like another one of the cool government agencies. Like the best one is the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. That's the one that I'm in, that the museum is a part of. And then there's the Department of Environmental Quality. And since we're all doing science and nature kinds of things, I feel like we get to be the best ones. Uh, we'll have to see what our guest thinks about that. Everybody, meet Laura Klebanski. Laura is the Executive Assistant for Councils and Commissions with the Divisions of Marine Fisheries. And welcome to the show, Laura. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. And I will just share my screen. And we can get started talking about, I agree completely, the awesome science and nature -y things that we do here <laughs> within the department. Do you also um, agree that the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources is the best government agency? Oh, I think we're all the best. Oh, okay. all right. <laughs> we do some really great work together. <laughs> I like that. That's a much better way to go. All right. So um, I will go ahead and get started. So uh, as he said, my name is Laura Klebanski, and I am um, one of the executive assistants for councils and commissions here at the Division of Marine Fisheries. So um, as the title says, I'm going to be your guide today as we navigate um, the people and the science and the services that the division provides and how that work um, allows the division to manage the marine and estuarine resources here in North Carolina. So just to begin, I want to sort of give you uh, how we fit into the DEQ picture. So um, DEQ is the parent agency of the Division of Marine Fisheries. You'll see here on the left, I have also included the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission. So this is a separate but very related agency that exists underneath the DEQ. They are the rulemaking body for marine and estuarine resources in the state. And so we work very closely um, with them uh, to implement their actions that they, they sort of make the decisions and we implement and we also recommend based on our science. So um, it may not surprise you to know that the Division of Marine Fisheries is located in the coastal region of the state. Here on the map, you can see um, the various offices, um, the field offices and also our district offices. Um, I today am located in headquarters, which is in Moorhead City, North Carolina. Um, and it's gorgeous outside, so I can't wait to get out. <laughs> um, I do want to say there's two things that make uh, North Carolina unique. Um, first of all, we have these two huge sounds. We've got the Albemarle Sound and the Pamlico Sound. And those, along with the other sort of smaller sounds and water bodies that are housed inside of our boundary, um, our boundary islands, um, our barrier islands, uh, make up the second largest estuary um, on the Atlantic coast. So we're second to Chesapeake Bay 
but we have an enormous amount of um, estuarine water. It's over 2 million acres. Um, the other thing that makes North Carolina really unique is that um, right at Cape Hatteras, so if you see on the screen, you see a Pamlico district office box, that point um, is Cape Hatteras. And that is a uh, mark where uh, moving ocean current, the um, Gulf Stream goes offshore about that, at about that point. And the cooler waters coming down from the north sort of take over off the shore of North Carolina. So because of these different features, this huge estuary and these different ocean currents interacting off our shore, we have um, an enormous diversity of species off of our coasts. And it is a great place to be a marine biologist. So because of that interaction and because fish won't stay still no matter how you try, um, we have a lot of species that we fish for here in North Carolina, but that actually are found along the entire Atlantic coast. So because of that, in addition to working with the Marine Fisheries Commission, we also work closely with the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council, the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission, and the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. And that's two federal um, councils and one interstate uh, fishery management council. And we work with them to manage all of these different uh, varieties of fish that we see off of our coasts. So the Division of Marine Fisheries is dedicated to ensuring sustainable marine and estuarine fisheries and habitats for the benefit and health of the people of North Carolina. So that is a big job. And to do that, you can see here sort of the outline of the division. This is how the division is organized. And you can see here at the center, we have the director's office. And around it, we have habitat enhancement, fisheries management, shellfish sanitation and recreational water quality, license and statistics, administrative and maintenance, and marine patrol. And these are all sections that work together to accomplish that mission that you saw on the last page. I did not include in detail, but I do want to acknowledge that we also have two other sections. They are not housed within the division, but they do work closely with us. That is um, our IT section and also our public relations section. We could not accomplish our daily tasks without these two groups. So I do wanna acknowledge that they are a huge part of what we do here. All right, so I'm gonna go through each of those sections and I'm gonna start here with the director's office. Now, the division has almost 300 employees, so there's no way for me to go through every single one of those people. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the leadership at the division um, for each of these different sections. So I'm going to start here with the director's office. There are um, three executive assistants like myself. You can see me over at the bottom on the far left. And I am the Marine Fishery Commission liaison. So I work directly with that state fisheries rulemaking body. Um, in addition to myself, there's also Trish Murphy and Chris Batsavage. They serve as the states and the division's representatives on the federal and interstate commissions. So they are actively involved in those interstate fisheries management actions that are going on. To the right, you can see Deputy Director Mike Leffler, who is our new uh, Deputy Director. And underneath him, you can see I've listed all of those sections. So he has the enormous task of overseeing sort of all of the operations of the division and all those different sections and making sure that all that work is getting done. All right, so I'm gonna go into the administrative and maintenance section. So here you can see Beth Gavoni, she is our section chief. Um, we love her, especially this time of the year when our budget is due. <laughs> She houses the budget purchasing and contracting staff. Um, she also ensures that we can keep our boats running and our facilities operating um, through her management of the maintenance staff. Um, and she also oversees the grants program. So the division um, provides funding to um, state and local um, agencies, to public or private businesses, to universities, to support funding um, that uh, benefits fishing and um, boating infrastructure in the state. So uh, this is an enormous, um, an enormous boon to the research that goes on in the state is this grants uh, program that provides this funding. 
All right, moving into license and statistics. This is run by the aptly named Brandy Salmon. Uh, and she oversees um, an enormous program uh, of various um, items. So uh, the license and statistics section, it collects, processes, and conducts economic analyses on commercial and recreational fishery statistics. So you can see here that we've got the trip ticket program. Um, that is actually a job. I worked in the trip ticket program before my current position. And this is how we capture all of the commercial uh, landings data from all of the commercial activity that's in the state. Uh, are, are basically all the fish that are landed and sold are reported to the division. So we can track how that is progressing. Um, she also oversees the coastal angling program. And that is, uh, includes a variety of recreational fishery sampling and survey programs that are run by the division. And that includes like mail, telephone, and online surveys um, for anglers who hold a commercial recreational, excuse me, a coastal recreational fishing license. Um, and they also conduct in-person interviews. So if you've ever been at a fishing dock in the coastal region and somebody has come up and interviewed you about your trip, that was the CAP program. The other piece is fishery statistics. Um, so they, like I said, they capture all this recreational and commercial data through these various programs. And uh, they basically process and share that data through the ACCSP connection. So this is a collaboration where we basically bring all of our data together and it's gathered into a single database management system that allows um, people to access it all up and down the Atlantic coast. So, and this includes landings, uh, the commercial harvest data from all of the Atlantic Coast states. All right, so moving into the shellfish sanitation and recreational water quality section. Um, this section is overseen by Shannon Jenkins um, and they uh, protect public health by monitoring shellfish and swimming waters for pollution. So this section um, includes, they issue sort of swimming advisories and shellfish closures, which I'll mention later, um, but they're responsible for classifying coastal waters as to their suitability for shellfish harvesting. So they go out, you can see here on the left, this guy in the red shirt, he's out there collecting um, water quality samples for the uh, swimming waters. This is to make sure that those waters are safe for people to swim in. You can also see um, the shellfish sanitation program. And um, we, this is a national program that we have to meet compliance for. Um, and you can see there's a dealership at the top where you've got these local conch and local oysters. Um, and they basically monitor those, make sure those are handled success, uh, safely, excuse me. All right, next up is Jacob Boyd. He is the section chief for Habitat and Enhancement Group. So this section manages a wide range of programs, including aquaculture permitting, shellfish leases, habitat mapping. Um, they house the CHIP program, that's the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan program, um, oyster restoration, and also artificial reefs. So on the screen here, you can see we've got the artificial reef sign. A lot of recreational anglers will be familiar with those. Um, and you see some staff on the bottom uh, collecting um, sediment samples, and this is part of our SAV mapping program. Um, they build reefs, they build um, reefs, they do culch planting, which allows for oysters, little baby oysters, to come settle on this shell that they plant and grow into big oysters for harvest. They also create um, oyster sanctuaries, which are areas that provide basically adult, it provides substrate for oysters to grow up, and then those areas, which are protected, um, from harvest, then can provide sort of larva for the entire ecosystem. So they put out this um, shell for the culture planting program and the larva that come from those sanctuaries can then populate that shell that they put out. Um, the shellfish lease program is a very popular program. It has grown enormously. Um, the legislature has provided a lot of support for that program and it is a great um, opportunity for people who are looking to get into fisheries um, for a way to produce 
a reliable product to sell to the public. All right. Um, next, we have fisheries management. So this is overseen by Steve Poland. He is our fishery management section chief. Um, they have an enormous number of data collection programs. I've listed some here um, and, and just some programs where they uh, we do what is called fisheries independent sampling, which is where we, the division scientists, go out and we have programs that we've developed over many years and we've conducted over many years, um, which if, you, if you're a scientist, you know that that time series can be really important to have. So we have some programs with very long time series that this um, section runs. So they also do outreach um, programs and uh, citizen science programs. So the fish tagging program is an opportunity for the fishing public to tag fish and then those fish are released. Uh, and then we can follow their movements using those tags. We also have the um, citation program. This is very popular with recreational fishermen. So you can write in and get a certificate um, if you catch a particularly nice specimen of some of our species. Um, we also have the carcass collection program. So if you're out recreational fishing, you can take the fillets off your fish and then give us the carcass because we're actually looking for that information that comes from the public. Um, we also, the fishery management section also houses the aging lab. This is where we, um, if you're familiar with an otolith, that's how we age fish a lot of times is we take, there's a little ear bone that we take out of them. You can slice it and it basically has rings, sort of like tree rings that we can count and use to age the fish. Um, and up at the top, you can see our estuarine trawl survey. Again, this is one of our independent um, uh, science programs where we collect data independent of the fishery. Um, and then the stock assessment program. Um, so I'm gonna mention the Fisheries Reform Act. The Fisheries Reform Act was a key piece of legislation for the way that North Carolina manages fisheries. I won't go into that here. Uh, I'd be glad to talk about it more at a different time. But what that required of us is that we have to manage our fisheries fishery sustainably and at a uh, defined um, probability. So to do that, we use stock assessments. So that's a way, you know, it's really difficult to go out and say, how many fish are there in the ocean? That's really challenging. So through all this data collection, we can get an idea using stock assessment models of how many fish are out there. Is the population growing? Is it fishing? Are we fishing too much? Or can we increase fishing? Um, it's a way for us to figure out how we're doing. All right, and then next up we have Colonel Carter Witten, he is the head of our Marine Patrol section. So this is the enforcement wing of the division. Um, this is the oldest state law enforcement agency in the state. And um, they are incredible. There are, uh, I believe, 56 officers who cover, as I said, that two and a half million acres of water. They have an enormous task, but they are dedicated and they are fantastic if you've ever run into them. Um, on the water. I highly recommend you have a conversation with them. Um, they do enforcement, but they also do outreach. So they talk to people. You'll see here on the screen, you've got um, a guy here on the beach talking. They uh, go to different events just to talk to people about marine fisheries and the importance of, of the rules and regulations that we put into place. Um, they also have a new swift water rescue team. It's about two years old now. But they worked through um, North Carolina Emergency Management to become a certified Swiftwater Rescue Team. And this is a pretty special um, group of people who do this. These are all officers who have volunteered to participate, and they have gone through a rigorous training program. And what this means um, is that we can now deploy our Swiftwater Rescue Team anywhere across the state, and they can help um, shore up emergency management. Um, for natural disasters or anything like that, that we can be part of that um, team. And especially for hurricane, hurricanes on the coast, um, that is an especially important role that they play is, is providing assistance to the public when we have those big natural disasters. 
<clears throat> All right, so that was sort of a really quick round robin. We talked about some of the people, the leadership, not the details, but the leadership, and then also um, what each section sort of brings to the table in terms of the science. So now I wanna talk about the services that we provide to North Carolina and beyond. So um, the first thing that you'll see on the screen are permits and licenses. So um, Brandy Salmon's uh, section, if you'll recall, they provide and sell North Carolina recreational coastal fishing licenses and uh, commercial fishing licenses. We also sell for hire licenses. So people who go out, um, they, there's sort of a growing business of people who um, take other people out. So fishing guides for hire, there's different terms for it, but we provide the licensing for those, um, for those folks. There's also shellfish leases. Um, this is in Brandy Salmon's section and also Jacob Boyd's section. They work closely together to um, do these shellfish leases and also the aquaculture permits. So we have a lot of other permits and, and types of sort of specialized licenses, but this is an important service that we provide to the state. We also provide data. So we provide um, uh, various annual documents that we release every year. On the screen, you can see we have the division's annual report. This is basically a compilation of all of the current year's data that we've collected, plus the previous 10 years data. It is an unbelievable resource if you're interested in fisheries in North Carolina. Um, it tracks how many fish are caught recreationally and commercially. It breaks it down by almost anything you can think about, <laughs> by species, by gear, where it was caught, um, who's catching it, all that information. We provide that report every year um, to the public. We also um, fulfill a number of data requests, and this sort of gets to that far right um, section of the screen where I talk about collaboration. So um, that doesn't seem like such an obvious service, but because fisheries management is such a big world and because it's so intertwined, because there are different stakeholder groups, the species swim all over the place, you can't keep them still. And because of that, we are constantly um, working and collaborating with um, other internal agencies, other DEQ agencies, um, other uh, federal agencies, and also NGOs, universities, all kinds, all of these groups that you see on the screen here, plus more, we are constantly collaborating. And, and that gets back to our data requests. So we provide data to many of these organizations to help with research, to improve our knowledge, to help us manage these species better. Um, and also for information, um, you know, in terms of management, how to improve our own internal state management around fisheries. So for habitat, um, for example, that's really a collaborative effort. Oops. All right, so another service we provide are documents. We are really good at producing really technical documents. <laughs> um, and it might not seem like a service when you try to read one, but it is. And the reason it's a service is because um, one thing we do is the division gathers all of the information that we have about the fisheries of this state. And one thing we do is we, we, um, we recognize where the data gaps are in our knowledge. So like I said, it's really hard to go out and count fish. It's just not possible. You're looking out at the water and you're like, how are these fish interacting? What are they doing? Where are they spawning? There's a lot of things we don't know about every species that we manage. And what the division does is it identifies the really key pieces of information that will be helpful to better manage the various species that we, that we do manage. And so we put that out into a document called Research Priorities, and that is used by all kinds of people all over the country um, to identify what they can do, uh, projects, information that's missing, to basically help us get that information to manage the species better. So it it gives, um, for example, um, we are on both sides of us, we have university marine labs, and those people often will refer to this when they are looking for grant money, they're looking for projects, things like that. We can say, hey, this is something that we really need to know, and we have a whole list of things that we need to know. 
Um, we also produce fishery management plans. So uh, we manage 13 species in North Carolina, sort of on our own. So the Marine Fishery Commission has 13 uh, species specific fishery management plans. Um, we also have an interjurisdictional plan. So you'll remember we had those other agencies that we co-manage with because of those Atlantic coastal species that move up and down the coast. There's about 21 species, and that interjurisdictional plan is how we sort of incorporate all of that federal and interstate management into our state management. Um, the fishery management plans are really comprehensive documents. Um, they are reviewed every five years, and it's basically a full analysis of the species specific fishery, and we do have um, fishery specific management plans. There is the potential to have other types of management plans, but that is currently how we have them. Um, so um, they have a comprehensive overview of the fishery, and then they also have the history of management in the state and also the current uh, needs of the fishery. So what do we need to do to continue to uh, fish this, have this fishery be sustainable? Um, the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan, that's sort of related to the fishery management plans. It's sort of a, a coastal habitat management plan, um, but it is a DEQ plan. So this is a little bit different. The fishery management plans are developed between the Division of Marine Fisheries and the Marine Fisheries Commission that I mentioned earlier. The Coastal Habitat Protection Plan is actually a DEQ level plan. So it is, um, it is in cooperation with uh, three commissions, they adopt this plan and it's implemented by three of the divisions within the department. And that is really important because while the Marine Fisheries Commission has some authority over habitat, they don't have the exclusive authority over habitat. And the Coastal Resource Commission, for example, it's really important if you're going to try to protect habitat that you include them in this, uh, in this type of management plan. All right, next up are sort of specific um, things that we provide for people to access. For example, swimming advisories. So if you come to the beach and you care about being safe while you're swimming, which hopefully everybody does, um, we put out these um, swimming advisories. So North Carolina, um, the, this is the recreational water quality section. They go out and sample beach and sound side swimming waters to um, check for bacteria. And they don't check for um, bacteria that make you sick, but they check for bacteria that are associated with those. And that basically indicates whether or not um, there's a risk when you swim in these specific waters. So they put out these, um, you can see on the, underneath that document, the precautionary swimming advisory, you can see this sort of online tool that we have. So the division um, is a heavy user, a user of ArcGIS. Um, because a lot of our um, products that we put out, uh, people are looking for specific areas. They're not looking um, for documents. They're looking for, can I go to this beach and swim and it's safe? We put out these mapping tools that allow people to access this information by just looking at the area that they're trying to get to. So there's the swimming advisory map. The next one over is the shellfish area temporary and permanent closures. These are um, essential to ensuring that people who are harvesting shellfish are harvesting it in a place that is safe. And so we put out this, again, there's a mapping tool that we put out. So if you as a citizen of North Carolina wanna go harvest your bushel of oysters, you can check on this map and make sure that the area that you're gonna go into is safe to harvest those oysters from. So this is an essential service that we provide to the people of North Carolina. The next item is the National Shellfish Sanitation Program standard. So um, North Carolina is on the interstate certified shellfish shippers list. So this is really important for um, our uh, shellfish um, dealers, people who are fishermen and dealers who are selling shellfish um, in state and also between states. This program uh, is run, it's a, actually a federal requirement that we meet the standards of this program. So um, the division ensures that that is the case and that we stay on this interstate certified shellfish shippers list so that our 
our product can be shipped out of state and then also that that shellfish is safe in the state. All right, so just to wrap it up, we've talked about a whole lot of stuff, but what are the actual benefits to uh, North Carolinians from all this activity? So the benefits are we have local seafood. We are um, sixth in the nation for uh, sixth in the on the Atlantic coast for the um, commercial harvest of seafood. We have fantastic beaches are heavily populated by tourists in the summer, as I can attest, living here in Moorhead City. Um, and when people go to those beaches, we know that they're safer because of the testing that we do to make sure those water, uh, the water quality is good. People also, we are second only to Florida with the number of recreational fishing trips. We have an incredible um, estuary and recreational uh, fishing population. So people love to go fishing. I would bet that most people listening today have a story, a family history of fishing. Somebody fishes, you go out fishing with somebody, everybody has a fishing story, um, or at least I haven't met anybody <laughs> without one yet. Um, and so we, because of all that work we do, um, we have fantastic fisheries for recreational fishing in addition to that co uh, commercial fishing. We also have incredible habitat. So again, we've got over 2 million acres of estuary. This is prime um, area to go. I recommend going kayaking, paddle boarding in this water. It's incredible. And it's also important for our resilience when it comes to climate change. Um, and also as population growth um, you know, continues to impact our coast, our coastal habitats are just essential. Um, uh, the other picture you see here is seafood. So when you go eat oysters in North Carolina, uh, well, let me say I will eat oysters in North Carolina. I know I am relying on the staff here at the Division of Marine Fisheries to make sure that those shellfish are handled safely. So um, these are all really ways that the division benefits the people of the state. And with that, I will wrap it up and I'm happy to answer any questions or talk about the division. All right. Thank you, Laura. That was an incredibly comprehensive overview. <laughs> and, well, I, I'm I'm sort of amazed that you like you got it all in to like 25 minutes because DMF seems like just a huge division, a lot of people who are doing a lot of different kinds of jobs, mm -hmm. uh, but all under like one roof. So it's yes, really impressive. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it is. The, the division, um, I think, you know, one of the reasons that I like to talk about the division is because of the extent of the work that we do. I think the Division of Marine Fisheries, when you think of that, you think, oh, it's, it's fishing, but there's so much around it, and there's so much that is important to maintaining healthy marine fisheries in our state um, that goes on at the division. So I think that's really important. Yeah, excellent stuff. Viewers, uh, I'll remind you, go ahead if you've got questions about anything you've seen or heard so far, drop them into the chat. I'm going to be looking to all of you in just a moment for your questions and thoughts. Um, but in, I'll give folks a minute to sort of download their thoughts and then get them typed up into the chat. Uh, but Laura, tell us a little bit about... Uh, as you just shared, a lot of different people use North Carolina's coastal resources in a lot of different ways. Commercial mm -hmm. fishing, recreational fishing, uh, just going and hanging out on the beaches. What are, I, I'm trying to imagine what the meetings or like the email threads are like <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> rulemaking or decision making uh, on how to use different resources because, you know, I can go out to, I don't know, Emerald Isle or something like that. And, you know, I'm I'm going, uh, you know, getting my boogie board and getting in the water. But then right next to me is somebody who's fishing. And so mm -hmm. we're both using this resource. We're both trying to get benefit from it. We're not in competition for it, uh, not to insinuate that. But folks like you at DMF have got to think about how everybody is going to use this stuff differently. And I wonder what that makes the meetings like. Oh, I think, um, you know, we have such a diverse stakeholder 
universe with the division. Just like you said, we have people who are just recreationally interested in laying on the beach and reading a book or eating uh, seafood consumers. Um, yeah. That's especially true, you know, inland. So in Raleigh and really big cities tend to have really passionate seafood people. <laughs> okay. um, and <laughs> we also get the commercial and recreational fishing um, stakeholders. And I think, like I said, everybody has a fishing story. So there are a lot of really passionate fishermen in our state. And um, that includes, you know, people who come down for the weekend. That includes people who have lived on the coast in these communities for hundreds of years. Um, and so it does, it can make our meetings um, really challenging because we have to consider all those different perspectives and views and try to balance all those different user groups. Um, but I think that's true with all, uh, you know, state agencies that are trying to balance resource use across a diverse uh, group of people. So it, it is challenging. It can make it um, difficult to find that balance. But I will say that our stakeholders, because they are so passionate, uh, tend to be involved all the time. So we hear from them all the time. We know a lot of them by name. We talk to people all the time about fisheries. And so because they're so involved, you know, we can get to those solutions more effectively. I love the idea that the Division of Marine Fisheries would be sitting around the table and that there would be somebody who would say, but what do the people in Asheville think about this? Absolutely. We do think about that. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, we are on the coast. And I think one thing, actually, I have a story from the Swiftwater Rescue Team. So they, um, they really, that whole group sort of uh, grew out of a desire to be more helpful with other law enforcement agencies. So the Marine Patrol officers have really pursued that um, as a way to be more useful to the people of North Carolina. And one thing that they talked about was when they started doing their training with emergency management, which shout out to emergency management, they have an amazing training program and um, are just incredible. So um, when they started working with those people, the trainers and the people, um, there are really good Swiftwater rescue teams out in Western North Carolina and Charlotte, um, all those groups, they just had never heard of marine fisheries <laughs> or they hadn't heard of marine patrol. Um, and that's not surprising because if you're not on the coast, then you don't interact as frequently. But um, because they got to interact with them, um, you know, they've just, it's like you have your eyes open to a whole new world. Um, I think, you know, what makes our state special is that we have from the mountains to the sea, right? We have an incredible diversity of landscapes. And so it's just really cool to be able to um, let people know about what's going on here at the coast and all of these people who are working to provide for everybody else across the state, including those folks in Asheville or Cherokee, you know, really far away. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. All right. Uh, one from the chat for you. Susie wants to know how the data from the aging lab is used. So aging data is used in our stock assessments. It basically gives us the ability to know how quickly fish are growing um, and sort of what our distribution looks like over our population. So like I said earlier, it's really hard to go out and sample fish. They swim around, um, they tend to not be stationary, they're all over the place and you can't see them most of the time. So we go out and try to characterize what our populations look like. So how old are the um, individuals in that population? Um, has that changed over time? One thing you wanna make sure is that you have a nice distribution um, across the population of all different ages. Um, and so the aging lab provides us with that data to be able to assess those populations specifically. And can you share with us what the 13 species are that have fisheries management plan? Oh, yes. Oh, what are the 13 species? So there's red drum, spotted sea trout, blue crab, oyster, clam. Mm, what are they? Oh, I'm going to fail. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, if you did all 13 off the top I know, of your head, that's I, really I impressive for anybody. I got sick. <laughs> oh, 
I'm gonna get I'm gonna get it from my colleagues now. <laughs> oh no. no, I can't do it. That's it. But I, I will I, say this: we have a fantastic website. We also have a fantastic photographer um, on our staff. He actually is part of that uh, outreach that DEQ does in our public relations office. He does amazing photography. And because of that, you can go onto our website, you can see all 13 species, and um, you can also see some incredible pictures that he has taken. Uh, somebody in the chat jumped in and added bay scallops, kingfish. Yes. yes. Shrimp, uh, striped bass. Yep. I don't know. I think there's a DMF employee in the chat. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how does the the division decide which fish to manage and who manages inland fish? So the Wildlife Resource Commission manages inland fish. And um, the division, uh, as part of the, this is sort of outlined in the FRA, that Fisheries Reform Act that I mentioned earlier in my presentation. And it basically outlines um, that we develop FMPs um, for uh, basically fish that have sustan substantial fisheries. So it's, it's sort of up to us to decide what does that, what, what constitutes that substantial fishery. So, We've had those 13 species have been pretty stable over time. Um, and, you know, we monitor other fisheries um, with the, an eye towards if we need to develop additional fishery management plans. All right. Excellent stuff. Not to make you nervous, but the DEQ YouTube channel is, is here now. So they're, uh, they're weighing in. Fantastic. Glad, glad they're here. Glad they're checking out. <laughs> uh, we added uh, river striped bass, river herring, and striped mullet to the list. Fantastic. I think that Thank rounds you. it out. Yes. I think that rounds it out. Uh, so, Laura, tell me a little bit about the work that you specifically do for DMF uh, and how that relates to uh, all of the different things you were sharing with us. Yeah, absolutely. So, I am, like I said, I'm the liaison for the Marine Fisheries Commission. And this gets into, again, that Fisheries Reform Act. So how we interact with the Marine Fisheries Commission and the division um, and how they work together. So I'm sort of at the, um, at the point where um, the division develops the fishery management plans and also develops recommendations for uh, management needs that might uh, come up. That is then presented to the Marine Fisheries Commission, and they are actually um, the ones who sort of select from those options that are developed by the Marine, by the Division of Marine Fisheries. So I work personally with the uh, Marine Fisheries Commissioners. We talk about um, the upcoming issues. We talk about the fishery management plans. And um, we basically, uh, I act sort of as a conduit between the two groups to talk about the science. I take the science and sort of work with the commissioners who are from all different areas. There's commercial fishermen and, and business owners, recreational fishermen, there's um, scientists, and then there's at-large seats on that commission. And they all work together with the division's recommendations to develop or to make the sort of final rulemaking decisions about how we're going to manage those fisheries. And, you know, so I, I, I love my job because I get to touch on all of these different programs because all of this stuff, you know, as the commission, as the rulemaking body, they're making these sort of final decisions based on all the science that all these people are doing at the division. And so I get to talk to um, all of our staff. I get to interact with all of these diverse programs and it is so cool the work that our staff does and the effort that they put into their work and then how that sort of translates into these fisheries policies and rules that the commission actually implements. That's awesome. It sounds like a pretty cool job. Yes, very. And you have an office that is in Moorhead City, not far from beach which uh, I think <laughs> the rest of us in North Carolina are like oh gosh that sounds awfully nice right it's a perk <laughs> five o'clock rolls around and you just roll out onto the beach absolutely <laughs> <laughs> for that nice time here um 
uh, I guess with the time that we've got left today, uh, and folks, there's a few more minutes. So if you've got more questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, but I'm I'm a little curious about how you and how uh, the Division of Marine Fisheries think about sustainably managing managing fisheries. Like you're collecting all of this data, but also looking at yeah, like major changes, like you mentioned climate change, for example, and how how the planet is changing and how that impacts how the other states around us are managing their fisheries and the decisions that they're making. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know, you see news reports or profiles where, you know, fisheries management is somehow at odds with the people who are doing the fishing from time to time, um, which, you know, it seems like in any relationship, not everybody gets along all the time. Um, but in thinking about how to plan for the future, so that there are, you know, blue crab and striped mullet for decades and maybe even more to come. How does DMF think about and calculate uh, sustainability into, into what they're doing? Absolutely. I think, you know, at, at the division, like I said, we are, um, we are a division full of scientists. And so um, the impacts from climate change and the changing um, habitats and the changing populations around us are um, always sort of at the top of our mind. Um, sustainable management of a resource means that we can't just take everything, right? And so I think you mentioned that there's, um, you know, we, we struggle with uh, the fishermen at odds with the, with the managers. And I think that's sort of a um, I hope that instead of at odds, we are, you know, it's more of a collaborative process. But the fact is, is that we do regulate fishing and, and that's not always popular. Um, and, however, um, I think that, you know, our work through um, the amount of collaboration that we do with all those groups I talked about, the universities, um, the other state agencies, the other, the NGOs, all of those groups, um, in addition to the stakeholder outreach that we do and the, and the input that we, we seek from our stakeholders, hopefully all of that is going to lead us um, to success in reaching a sustainable sort of compromise, because that's, that's really where it sort of lands. You have to find a compromise with conserving the resource so that we continue to have access to it, but also continuing to allow that access and what that looks like. Um, I think as far as climate change goes, um, you know, I think we already are, it, it is a huge topic at um, not only in North Carolina, but along the Atlantic coast, all over the world, obviously. And um, we do a lot of work with our um, other agencies like the South Atlantic, the Mid-Atlantic um, Fishery Management Councils. Those are our federal councils. We also at the Atlantic um, states Inter, uh, interstate commission, those are all places where we have to talk about what's happening in fisheries and how do we move forward in a sustainable way. So, um, you know, one of those things is like population shifts. So one thing that can happen is as um, sea water, uh, sea temperatures warm, we see sort of population, population starting to shift northward. Um, and, and that's where we get into, you know, because we have that Fisheries Reform Act and because we are um, somewhat flexible in how we develop those fishery management plans, we can take into account, are there new fisheries developing? Are there fisheries that used to exist that maybe aren't anymore? Um, you know, and sort of adjust management over time based on those, on those things that we're always thinking about. That's excellent stuff. And yeah, you know, I was kind of, as you were talking there, I was thinking that, yeah, DMF, you mentioned at the very beginning, has a 200-year history of uh, of working with the people and communities out there in, for everyone's benefit uh, to make sure that they're, they're, you know, fish to eat and fish to fish and fish to look at for a <laughs> long time, uh, and that... Uh, it sounds like North Carolina has pretty productive waters mm -hmm. and it's got to be at least in part due to DMF listening and paying attention to all the various stakeholders uh, as well as incorporating the science 
and bringing those things together in a way that that really has worked for everybody for a long time, yeah. or at least seems like it. I hope that's the case. Yes, um, I think, you know, I, yes, I think so. And um, we have a saying in the division, if nobody's happy, then we've probably done our jobs. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that's not completely true, but we, you know, we do have to balance a lot of perspectives and user groups and everything, um, including the science and what the science tells us and how those populations are, are doing. So, yes, I think over time, um, the division has been very successful and just North Carolina in general um, has been very um, forward thinking and it's the approach to fisheries management, the fisheries reform act is really a special piece of legislation that was implemented back in 1997. It sort of, uh, it's in the same vein as the Magnuson-Stevens uh, Act and it sets out standards that we have to follow. And not every state has that ability, but because we do, North Carolina, I think is um, in a good position in terms of fisheries management and the work that we do to conserve and protect those resources for the public. Awesome stuff. Uh, so uh, one more question came in for you from the chat, but um, you can you can just like plead the fifth out on this one. <laughs> okay. Are there ever any conflicts between commercial fishermen and recreational fishermen? Um, are there ever any conflicts? Is that what the question was? I'm sorry. That's the text of the question. Okay. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, and we deal with that um, on a regular basis. I think one thing that uh, because uh, like North Carolina has this amazing diversity of fisheries, um, we have seen an absolute explosion in the popularity of recreational fisheries in our state. And that's, that's true here and that's true all along the Atlantic coast. Um, we're just seeing really people are getting out on the water. They're enjoying you know, all these resources that we have in North Carolina. And uh, because of that, they are interacting more with, um, you know, more traditional, uh, well, it's all traditional, but with the traditional fishermen and activities that occurred in certain areas. And that's a, you know, it's a balance trying to find how to allow all of those people, all of those North Carolina, uh, North Carolinians to use these resources um, without, you know, reducing that conflict and, and finding ways to um, resolve it successfully. That's awesome. It, I mean, it. Uh, I think y'all are probably pretty good at it. At this, I... <laughs> like, like DMF knows what's up, you know who to talk to, uh, you know, if, if something is going wrong or even better, if like everything's going right. Absolutely. It's like DMF is out there doing the work of engaging with people you know, whether things are going right or wrong, doing that relationship building, the community outreach, uh, and bringing everybody along mm -hmm. so that, you know, if even if there is conflicts, right, you find ways to work through it uh, for the, to make sure that everybody gets these benefits that you shared with us from the work. Exactly. Yeah, so, that's awesome. Uh, Laura, thanks for being on the program today. It was awesome to learn about your work and everything that the Division of Marine Fish <laughs> has got going on. Glad well, you're I, out there doing it. Thank you so much. And I hope, like you said, this is sort of the beginning of a conversation. It's it's a lot, but I think um, hopefully there's more people out there now who know that we touch on all of these, uh, you know, pretty vast universe of topics. And hopefully we can continue that conversation with the public. Uh, throughout the program, everybody, the Office of Environmental Education was dropping links to the Division of Marine Fisheries website and specific resources that are out there that you can investigate and take advantage of in whatever way you might be interested in uh, on your visit to the coast or in any activities you might be taking part in. So take advantage of those resources. Uh, just like the Lunchtime Discovery Series, these are all brought to you pretty much for free. I mean, you pay taxes, but you know. They come to you courtesy of the state of North Carolina. And so they are out here for you to use, learn about, take advantage of, and we hope make your life better in North Carolina. Uh, and with that, I'm going to probably walk up a few blocks and get some oysters. 
and we'll see you again next time. Laura, thank you for being here. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, everybody. Hey, we will be back here next Wednesday. We're going to be talking uh, microbes and the new book, Unseen Jungle, with author and science communicator Eleanor Spicer Rice. It's going to be fun. There's bound to be good jokes. Eleanor is fantastic. So don't miss out. We'll be back here next Wednesday at noon. Take care. Be well. Be kind. If you like them, go have an oyster. And we'll see you again soon. Bye, folks. Should say go get a North Carolina oyster. Bye, folks. <laughs>